children. It is time to introduce a guest. To introduce a wonderful, wonderful guest. Boys and girls, it is my greatest honor to announce <laughs> Mr. You might be wondering why I'm interrupting your experience right now. The answer is very, very simple. Because I have something to plug. In case you did not know, this video is sponsored by who you may ask? By me. Parafox Studio. It's a nice website that you can go to and be able to chat with the lovely foxy folk. That's not it though. If you subscribe starting at $5 per month, then you get access to a wide range of emotes that is frequently being updated. And the best part is that 100% of the proceeds goes directly towards the studio and not to a trillion dollar corporation, uh, amazing. So if you wanna support the channel, please consider joining us at parafox.studio that is www.parafox.studio anyway back to the interview with ted anderson <laughs> hey everybody hello <laughs> how's it going it's, we're doing pretty good uh I, I gotta say i'm super excited i'm a very big fan of yours oh great i'm, I'm glad to be here so thanks for having me oh yeah uh so as we mentioned earlier today, uh, we did do a series of Tonight We Riot, and obviously you're you're doing pretty good numbers on Twitter. And I found that pretty early, probably in the midway of myself, like getting more involved with politics and workplace organization. I know you worked for Nintendo and Gearbox. Was there like an inciting incident that really started Tonight We Riot, or was it a big culmination over working with uh, such large gaming companies? Uh, it was basically the culmination of years and years of working in video games and um, noticing a downward trend in benefits, um, in pay, and so on and so forth. And just how, like, just generally, the way workers were treated was just getting worse and worse and worse. Like, all, pretty much all the promises that tech, big tech made that, like, you know, they were going to do right by workers, and, you know, this time you could trust the capitalists. Um, you know, were becoming the obvious lies that they were. And, um, you know, like there's stuff that existed when I worked at Gearbox that I've never seen again. And I don't know if they still do it, but I would highly doubt it if they did. Like we got royalties from our games that we made. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I have never had that happen again. Like in 23 years of working in video games, that was the only company and the only games I've ever made any direct money off of outside of a salary. Wow. So wow. like, and that's when like, if you consider how many units of uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze and uh, Mario Kart 7 for the 3DS sold, like even if I was just making two cents off of each one of those, I would have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> those are those are the uh, titles that you worked on when you were working with Nintendo. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So. That, enough, yeah, I book. told you he's a heavy hitter. Holy moly! Yeah. <laughs> I love this about Scout because he uh, they they don't have. Um, a sense of hierarchy so it was very bold of them to just like come up to you and say like hey do you want to do this interview and you graciously uh decided to come here so thank you so much for that as well um but uh the one thing i was uh, i do want to talk about is uh when you were deciding to start the pixel pushers union uh, were you uh like were you like the head of that or what's your position for them um so i was the person who started it up Mm -hmm. um and currently you know one of the you know the few people who's still on board with it which is fine like you know that was one of the things i always wanted was it to be just very free and open um and so yeah you know it's it was the idea of after having like learned about like the wobblies and stuff and like shop democracy 
uh, realizing that you know you could easily export that to working on small indie teams, if not actual larger teams as well. And decided to give it a go because we had uh, managed to get the eye of uh, a South by Southwest recruiter. And that pretty much allowed us to uh, really get some eyes on our, our game. Oh, and so yeah. I was like, okay, now this is going to become a real thing. How do I want to handle this? And I wanted to make it so I wasn't just like, you know, the big dude on top who made all the decisions because that's one, it's just not something I'm comfortable with. And two, you know, I wanted to, you know, show the world that there was a better way to do this kind of thing. So. Yeah. And I, I, I remember, uh, I actually, I think I might, the clip of South by Southwest might still be out there, but uh, I, I don't think they, you know, it's really hard for uh, a lot more explicitly political games, especially a left, uh, a explicitly socialist game uh, to really get the light of days. Um, goodness gracious, where was I? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, this, I'm like a thousand things are going through my head. Only one of us got the uh, the ADHD treatment here, but um, <laughs> I mean, for that, it it seems like it really worked out for you guys. Um, like, was there any sort? So obviously, when you went through the IWW, right? But we didn't uh, you go did? through them; they just inspired us. Oh, okay. Oh. So it's uh, yeah, d definitely um, yeah, they're a great a uh, great place to start if you ever think about like starting a union uh, for our audience out there. But uh, for organizing something as horizontal as it is, like really trying to keep uh, the, like a hierarchical pyramid down, was there any new ways to have to think about the industry or did it really just seem to be a lot more natural as far as the collaboration in the nature of making video games? Uh, to me, I, I really enjoyed it a lot more um, because uh, I do feel like it, it led to a more uh, natural discussion. So much of... Working in games is very collaborative, uh, you know, especially at a, a small level that I think one of the things I've learned over time of working on mod teams or working for, you know, larger studios is that if you have someone at the top who just gets to squash things because they want to do their idea, mm -hmm. like that's it's no fun <laughs> it, it, it and, seems like that's the way we ended up with so many different ubisoft clones <laughs> right you end up with someone who has a very distinct idea of how they want to approach things and how they want to make a game but it ends up clouding out every other possible idea and i do feel like that's why you get a lot of very sameness in a lot of games is you know that and other you know capitalist influences of like you know there's a board of directors or uh, shareholders who want to make sure that this game does numbers in a particular way and so it can only have this kind of content we want it to be exactly like the last one that shipped six million units so you know you, you end up with uh, essentially you know the same game over and over and over again yeah and really I think that's one of the reasons why uh, indie games did and do as well as they do yeah, they're really trying to find a new stone to squeeze as much water out of. Sorry, you were saying, Scott? Uh, I was I was just going to ask. Uh, I I would probably assume that you have a lot of uh, a lot of empathy and uh, sorry. Uh, you okay. have a, you have a lot of empathy for the uh, game developers for uh, big companies that produce these these games that are released and have like very low ratings and I, I, I would assume that you probably think that the developers are getting a lot of a lot of hate that they don't really deserve because they have a lot of higher expectations that are brought upon them. Well, I think it's, you know, it's a lot of things all at once. Um, I, I do think that, you know, that there is a misconception among a lot of people who would, like, really self-apply the term gamer to, one, what they're due as an audience. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, like, how the process, you know, basically how the sausage is made. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that being said, like, 
you know, there's there's a lot of people who get, get just catch all sorts of hell for making something they love. And man, that sucks. Like <laughs> there's some stuff that can be helped and there's other stuff that can't. And it's some stuff that like especially if it's like a larger game, you know, mm-hmm. it's somebody who's got like a Twitter account is not going to be, you know, in charge of making the game the way that you just imagine, you know, the person, the, the figurative you imagine the game should be. Right. Like, and I I so, do uh I do notice uh, me and me and Chris were actually talking about this uh before we started the stream about uh mm-hmm. the history of Cyberpunk 2077 and how it got a bunch of backlash like the developers got a bunch of backlash when the game was released and ultimately people failed to kind of realize how rushed the game was because of the hype that it brought up yeah and like when a game gets rushed that's not the fault of the you know the, the people who are like working the line and making a game you know it it's they don't have any say in that if I'm just a person who's making character art or doing UI programming or what have you, mm-hmm. I really have no say in when that game ships outside of my own productivity. But even then, like, you know, I'm a I'm a human being. Yeah, <laughs> you can't be and working have 16 limits. hours like or yeah, what it's like almost to like a week. Some I've heard maybe that's hyperbolic, but. I mean, I work in an I mean, industry where I'm working 16 hours a day, so it doesn't really seem that far off. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I've i worked, you know, hideous hours before, and that shit sucks. It takes it out of you, um, like, in a really bad way. So, you know, when somebody comes in and is like, man, what a shitty game, you know, it... <laughs> Would I you... could do better than this, or you know, whatever, or like, how come you didn't add multiplayer, which is also my favorite. Oh um, man, because I'm like, that, that's incredibly difficult. Uh, <laughs> if I, very difficult. if I may ask, uh, when, sure. when you, when you do have those like kind of burnout moments in the, uh, like where you work all these excessive hours in the. Uh, working on this one game do you did you ever feel at any point uh like a sense of demotivation and like uh, a lack of a lack of passion for like burnout yeah like Like, a like true like burnout and lack of passion towards the game that you're making uh yeah you know especially if you know feeling rushed or if you're getting very direct uh, control over your creative process, but you're also already kind of burned out. Like that, that becomes very much like trying to squeeze blood from a rock. <laughs> and uh, like, I, I guess it's one of those peculiar things that people sometimes don't understand is that creativity ebbs and flows. It, mm-hmm. it, if it's there, that's great. That rules. Uh, if it's not, like, it can be a fucking torture to try and force your body to be creative when it is not feeling creative oh and i definitely know that one <laughs> that is uh it sucks yeah I, as far as that i mean obviously things have got to change and unionization especially in the gaming industry seems to be a really popular idea uh are you pretty optimistic of that uh, is there any sort of as an insider uh, do you have like any advice to someone who may or may not be thinking of this unionization process or are there any obstacles you found yourself that you'd like to share? Uh, I think that like really the biggest thing that I could suggest to anybody is that they, if they are interested in a union, that they do talk to, you know, their colleagues like about it and they talk about it explicitly and they don't talk about it in a joking manner but like as you know i think everybody who's worked in the industry can tell you like lunch times with your colleagues is a time to kvetch about you know every little thing that you don't like about what you do for a living <laughs> and what sucks is that like that ends up going nowhere if you're just whining about it or complaining about it like that's one thing and yeah, it's nice to blow off steam but if you're not doing anything with that, like, yeah, you know. It, there has to be a place for the stone to roll, right? 
Right. There's a lot of analogies then, about rocks here. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I was going to give my, my own about, um, you know, I just read a quote the other day and I can't remember who it's attributed to. So forgive me for that. But it said that like <laughs> the idea of revolution is, you know, it's not a ripe apple that you pick off of the ground. It's a ripe apple that you pluck from a tree. And, you know, it's basically, yeah, you got to put in the work. And that means that you got to be okay with sometimes you're going to fail and people aren't going to be interested and that's okay. You know, maybe next time they will be, maybe during crunch, they will be, maybe when one of their friends gets laid off, they will be, you know? Yeah. There's a, uh, there's a definitely, um, I mean, to quote the, the, the big commie game, uh, disco Elysium, the communism is about failure, but you take it in another way. These failures tend to, uh, actually build into something because we learn about our mistakes and i've noticed like uh i recently not recently but way back in the day i tried unionizing a pizza shop and there were great failures as far as that um like staying undercover you know because if anyone utters a word about a union especially us living in arizona um i'm amazed we weren't burned at the stake for it but it, it gets shut down pretty quick and people get fired so um yeah, which yeah. also, by the way, for anybody listening out there, is tremendously illegal. Like, but they count on you not one, not knowing that, and two, mm-hmm. not having enough money for representation or knowing what to do about it. And that's like they count on your ignorance. They want you to not know. Yeah, and especially uh, workplace policies, uh, quote unquote policies, with uh, discussing your pay. Uh, de- definitely do that. Talk talk shop. Um, now I'm just preaching, <laughs> but. Um, I just want to make sure we're we're you know keeping time well uh, is there anything uh you had going on as far as uh any other projects coming up in in the works uh yeah we've actually uh just really started work in a real way on what hopefully will be our next project uh which we actually tried to start a while ago but there was this whole pandemic thing that happened and it turns out here in constant reader that uh it's tremendously difficult to be creative and then have the willpower to do anything under crushing anxiety and depression Ooh. so yeah. it got shelved for a bit yeah <laughs> but I think, we're bringing uh, it back and it's going to be a, a haunted mall game uh, it's called the five points mall ooh. and a nice little homage to the the classic uh horror games of yore in a very PS1 style. Oh, wow. Wow. That sounds incredible. That is there, uh, I mean, are there any shout outs for uh, Five Points Mall there? Like, do you guys have a website or is it still very much in the backlogs right now and in uh, in the making? Yeah, it's still very early days. So we're going to try and get to a place where we can start posting screenshots or videos of it, hopefully within the next month or so. We've got a nice, neat little team that's working away on it, including yours truly, and uh, another person who's our programmer name uh, goes by uh, Author Nye. I can't remember. I can't totally remember how to pronounce their <laughs> Twitter handle, but uh, they're great. They've been doing wonderful work on it, and um, yeah, we're, we're hopefully going to have some cool stuff to see here in a little while. That is amazing. Uh, I do have. Uh, I do have a question. I know, crazy. In an interview, I have a question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Tonight We Riot was a game that was published during a very crucial time in the U- in the U.S. I mean, November was it November of 2020? I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. well, that was right before everything. That was <laughs> no. That was, was right like, before the pandemic. That's crazy. No, 2020. That was the peak. Oh, that was a peak. Yeah, it um, was like we. Oh, COVID nineteen. Yeah, I remember being. Uh, kind of pissed that we didn't get to do any kind of release party because like it was May (laughs) and like I was two and a half months into the you know the release of the pandemic (laughs) but um yeah I remember uh oh I'm so sorry I did not mean to to interrupt you that's all right uh i i do remember watching this the small clip of an inter- of an interview that was taken with you uh it was around like 2019 when you were announcing the the uh, release of tonight we riot and yeah i can definitely see how you know considering how much effort y'all put in that you weren't able to get a get a get a release party or anything like that fucking sucks 
Uh, yeah, we had some good ideas on what we were going to do about it, too. And alas, alack, that ship has sailed. Uh, but we still had, you know, really good sales, all things considered. We really <laughs> uh, blew away what our initial publisher was thinking we'd be able to sell. But like orders of magnitude which is mm -hmm. gratifying and um you know we've also been able to use the money that we've earned from the game to help out a variety of causes that we like as well when you guys were publishing the game uh did you guys come across any particular obstacles because i know that publishing a as unapologetically a left-leaning game as that it must come with some some sort of uh it's got to be a hard sell it's got to be a hard it's got to be a hard sell especially to big corporations such as steam and nintendo that wasn't an issue at all uh really here we never got any kind of pushback at all uh from them uh getting onto steam was easy as could be no issues Nintendo, I think the, the only thing that really surprised me about that was that we managed to get through the verification process called Lot Check on the first try, which is, let me tell you, as someone who's shipped, uh, been a part of shipping three Nintendo games, unheard of. <laughs> so <laughs> we, had, we had scheduled out for our lives like the next four or five months of like going back and forth on Lot Check stuff, and then all of a sudden it was just like, oh, we can ship the game. Um, huh. if you don't mind me asking, what what exactly is the logistics with lock check? What is that? What what is it? What did the uh, what does it serve? <laughs> oh, um, uh, that is just to make sure that your game works mostly. Uh, uh, there's nothing that's gonna like soft block or uh, you know keep the player from enjoying the game. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing that's gonna you know yeah uh, not brick, but like you know crash the the switch. Uh, that it actually works with all the controllers that are officially Nintendo, things of that nature. Yeah, it was and nice to actually buy a finished game nowadays. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> although well, one of the things that was funny that we got bounced back to us a lot by, by players was that there's this screen that is like, it has a, a bit of text on it that says like, click or like press A to continue if you, something about like the controller. And we would get like, emails in a variety of uh, levels of either just kind of confusion all the way to rage, saying that we had sold them a broken game, mm -hmm. that the, the thing didn't work, that you, you know, they got this screen and they couldn't play it, and then we'd just be like, well, you just press A. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you really and... can't please everybody. <laughs> Oh, that but, is. You know, with the people who were like kind to us about that, you know, God bless you, because. You know, there was other people who were just like, you bastard. And it was just like, yeah, well, you could just press A. That's yeah. Be like it says right there. And uh, that's not even our UI prompt. That was Nintendo's. Um, but yeah, that was that was probably the only minor issue we ever ran into with uh, Nintendo at all. And that was a very minor one. We haven't had it pop up since. But no, that, it's very easy. I remember reading uh, that your earliest uh like your earliest start of like how you kind of started your career was essentially making mods for uh half-life like essentially i'm asking you know like what what was the main uh motivator that kind of got you into the the world of game development and you know like what oh, what uh, kind of got you into accident. it <laughs> It was a it was a total accident, coupled oh. with being a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, and um, so this was this is back in the 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 dark days of uh, the medieval times, known as the 1990s. Oh. And uh, I was screwing around with stuff like uh, like Quick Two and uh, Half Life and stuff like that. And any old way. Uh, there was a mod called Action Quake 2, and I was, you know, I, I enjoyed the mod, I played it, and I started seeing, like, these these people who are making their own game out of this existing game, and hell, I love that idea. It's like getting a free game for having the game that you already bought. <laughs> and, you know, as somebody with a, a limited allowance as a kid, like, <laughs> fuck yeah, hook it to my veins. Um, <laughs> It's like uh, but, uh, building a car straight from the pickup part, you know? Pretty much. 
And yeah, so I was screwing around in there and it just so happened that I bought this um, Argon software called PC Paintbrush and its native format just so happened to be .pcx, uh, which was the native format for Quake 2 skins. Mm. And as I was uh, looking around on my computer, trying to find artwork, because this is back in the day of like Windows 3.1, folks. Uh, oh, wow. There wasn't that much memory involved. You could just idly peruse everything that was on your machine. And um, I stumbled through the Quake 2 directory, and all of a sudden there was all these flattened versions of monsters and characters from the game. And I was like, wait a second, I can open these? <laughs> sure enough, I did. Remember, I scribbled some bright orange on one of them, saved it, and then opened the game, and sure enough, that monster had bright orange all over its face. And at that point, a uh, monster was born. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and then when I got involved in that scene, I was starting to make my own textures and stuff for fun. And the Action Quake 2 team, uh, a large par portion of them went on to go make a little mod called Counter-Strike. Oh. And I followed along with them. And I ended up making a map or not making the map, but rather the textures for that map. Um, CS747. And once I'd done that, like, you know, years later, it would turn out that would become the thing that would give me my boost in my career. Wow. Because it went into the retail version, and all of a sudden I had a, a you know, a retail uh, resume. That um, is, it is amazing so. how much, like, Every time I look you up, I feel like I I learn a little bit more. But now it's just like the the floodgates seem to be open here. <laughs> I, I don't know. You seem like um a, pr a pretty big player, like as far as uh, the industry goes. But it, it's funny how you guys can create so much, but still like stay under the radar as far as like the mainstream uh, like pop popularity. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, a big part of that was, like, when I was working in, at Nintendo, like, that was kind of the unspoken rule was that you do not have a public persona. You know, it was just, like, you, you stay under the radar, you don't do anything public, we don't want anything to be said where Nintendo would have to be, like, you know, avow or disavow a thing that you've done. And um, so I got really used to just being like, I don't exist. Yeah, yeah. I, we don't want another like a uh, notch incident happening. Oh boy, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's very man. Amazing how many people who are like billionaires just can't shut up. Oh, <laughs> it's very. Uh... That's the thing. You have to get up to nine hundred, nine hundred, like nine hundred ninety nine million dollars. You have to stop right there. Yeah. Uh, once you hit that billion, <laughs> you it's just you. You got a motor. Yeah. Yeah. It's really bizarre to me how easy it is for big corporations like Nintendo and Valve to just completely disregard uh, their workers and developers. Like, mm -hmm. I, I find it really uh, disheartening at how often the uh, publishing companies and just all of these AAA uh, titles being released and the the Twitters they're just like oh yeah uh, this is a game that's going to be out like barely giving any credits to the developers and it's it's, it's very it's very disheartening how m little respect goes to developers yeah and I feel like that's something that could definitely change um, you know it's like even with the most recent uh, Metroid uh, release where they did a like, like a modernization, you know, like revamped it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, in the credits, they put like you know all the previous employees as just like that was the phrase or something like along those lines. And I was just like, dang, dude, come on, just <laughs> list their name. It's a text file. It's a text file. I'm sure you could probably go to your payroll, like take that Outlook <laughs> file. Or, or like the Excel file and just copy the names there and then paste it. It's right. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's not it's not a hard thing to do. You know, you could definitely do it. This is just it's either weirdly petty or it's just like, I don't know. 
I don't I don't like you calling people like lazy because and that's not even like a backhanded way of calling him that, but it's just it just seems like weirdly wishy washy. Incons- inconsiderate? Just like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just do it. It would be fine. <laughs> of course. <laughs> not I, that much extra work even. I was uh I've been I've been wondering this ever since we scheduled this uh, interview. What was the 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 main the main kicker that kind of radicalized you? Was it was it any was it by reading any books or or movies or any piece of media in particular? Or were you always kind of spiritually uh, left leaning? Did you have family that was left leaning? Villain origin story, etc. Uh, no, it, it's it's probably closer to like you know, a comic book origin story to be honest. But uh, <laughs> no, there was it was a couple different things. It was never just one isolated incident. Um, you know, I just I saw how you know capitalism had just absolutely raked people I love over the coals and just left them destitute at the end of their life and you know that was a big part of it and like how that person who i loved had just been like a big believer in doing shit like the lottery which to this day is like i have a special <laughs> a special place in my heart for hating the lottery um you know and then funny enough it was a, a bad date that i had with a, a wonderful woman who was a uh, avowed communist we had a very good discussion about politics and she said that basically you know hey if you feel this way about these politics you shouldn't just hide it you should just be it and that was kind of like a trajectory moment for me also my own you know nature of wanting to find out why things are the way they are that's always been a guiding light for me um and then not liking uh inefficiency <laughs> aid and efficiency and so when i look at capitalism most of the time i see nothing but inefficiencies and like purposeful ones that are baked into the system that basically are there to do little more than cause people pain and it's not even necessarily that they want to cause people pain but it's that it's cheaper to cause people pain than to fix the problem and that's so effed up <laughs> like i just i can't get back i can't get on board with an ideology that supports that so you know it, yeah i can i can hear uh david graber screaming from across the country at us <laughs> there's it's just <laughs> a, like there's so many different bullshit jobs um to create this air of efficiency to essentially make something inefficient god i, I worked in insurance for probably about three years and that is top to, well the, the industry top to bottom is a fucking scam oh yeah and it, it's <laughs> It's so amazing. Like you almost kind of um, have to kind of kill the liberal in your head to say like, yeah, you care about the social things, but there is a mechanism that is better, a complete transition over to these things. Did, were, you, were you kind of like a lib before everything or did you kind of like in your heart of hearts, uh, were you one of the good ones and actually think, well, maybe things aren't right from the, from the go? Uh, no, actually from the very beginning, I was very lazy. Um, I... <laughs> When I was 18, I voted Republican because my parents voted Republican and I asked them who I should vote for. And so I did. And that was the one and only time I've ever done that. Because immediately afterwards, uh, was it was Bush, it was 9-11, it was the Iraq War, it was all these things and I was watching it happen and I was like, holy crap, this sucks! And immediately started moving leftward from there. Uh, to be, you know, becoming a, a, a centrist, to becoming, you know, a, a quote-unquote moderate liberal, to becoming a liberal, to becoming quote-unquote very liberal, <laughs> and then eventually just all the way over to becoming a damn dirty red. Yeah. And and it was just because every time I ran into an issue where there was something that, like, the conservatism couldn't fix, or didn't want to fix, or if there was something that liberalism didn't want to fix, or if there was the tremendous amounts of just self-importance and uh, just, I watched too much West Wing of a centrist that, you know, just, just irked me because it would just be like, well, we can't do that because it's not allowed. And it's like, well, that's a shit reason. 
So <laughs> literally the uh, other party looks at that challenge and says like, but how do we still do it anyway? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think that was the thing that bothered me the most was like watching the GOP just run circles around the Democrats when the Democrats would be like, we can't do that. It'll make the GOP mad. And I'm like, yeah, who gives a shit? Fuck them. You know, yeah, let them rage. And, and like, in all honesty, I like, um, I know electoralism is a little, um, uh, debated on, especially in the left, but I mean, like a lot of, uh, younger kids are really starting to come in there. Um, uh, we, there's a group that I talk with called progressive victory. They're definitely on the electoral side, but it seems to be, you know, a good preventative maintenance that a lot of kids are starting to turn out and really be, uh, politically conscious because I, I, I think I really got politically conscious probably around 16, but now it's like, you know, you're finding five-year-olds on TikTok talking about like seizing the means of production. Uh, it, does it, does it kind of make oh, you a little you bit more hopeful? My kids know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, like it, it's to the point now to where it's like, it seems like, you know, the kids might be all right. Uh, we obviously still have like internet fascism to deal with, but from especially the Bush years, because God, we, like it was so stigmatized. The word communism was like saying, I don't know, it, it will do the same stopping power as like the N word in a crowded restaurant. Like it, it, it yeah, had- Yeah, it definitely used to be the thing you did not say that you were. Yeah, so now it was, um, I think a good thing about like socialism and communism all in all is like seeing that like beacon of light oh, oh, it, at the end of the tunnel there. It is, has that gotten really a lot more brighter as like time has gone on? Uh, you know, I think it has. Um, I don't think by any means anybody should rest on their laurels at all. Uh, I think we have to keep pushing, keep fighting, keep organizing. And I think it's kind of like, you know, this might be apocryphal, but what Lenin said, which was that, you know, there are, uh, you know, years where weeks happen. Or excuse me, there's weeks where years, <laughs> I'm getting all my, mixed up here. There's uh, years where weeks happen and there's weeks where years happen. And the history, because I was a history major in college for and that's always been a guiding light for me too, is reading about history, is that history ebbs and flows. You know, sometimes there's there's very stable periods. It doesn't mean that that means that those are good periods for everybody involved, but there's also other periods where things go off kilter and there's real potential for revolutionary change. And yeah. I think we're going towards that. Yeah. I think we're really starting to get to that uh, class consciousness even it, like I work for the United States Postal Service and I hear people talking about socialism, uh, a, a trade mostly known for being Republican flooded. So I think yeah. it's it's a little bit better. I think um, I mean, everyone, a lot of people hate to admit it, but I think Bernie running in 2016 might have really took some stigma off of it. But people actually going and using Google to look this shit up it's um we're doing better but like you said if we just keep putting the pressure on i think there's a good momentum forward but uh as things heat up we are also going to get that pressure back and i think building tighter communities uh is really going to help it especially um you know as far as uh things go now but i i just, i know uh, we're starting to go over your time here uh, but was there anything you wanted to shout out? Uh, anything for the new game tonight, We Riot, or any other projects here where your friends are working on? Um, no, not really. Uh, nothing that really springs to mind. We already talked about how we're working on that mall game, and that's pretty much the only other focus I have right now. So, uh, you know, I guess the only thing I could say is that folks, you know, get involved in your communities. Um, and I mean, like, really get involved. Do the stuff that seems boring. Like, you know, I go to... PTA, you know, whenever they do like PTA uh, open houses, you know, I go to those. My wife's involved in those, uh, you know, very much so involved in those. And, you know, we want to, you have to be a member of your community. Go out there, say hi to your neighbors. <laughs> say hi to the postman even. Yeah, we really need yeah. water. Please give us water, touch grass. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, just like get out there because I think one of the, the biggest things that I remember stunning one of my, uh, you know, liberal friends was whenever, uh, Charlottesville happened mm -hmm. and they were crowing about how, like, you know, this is why we need to vote. And I said, there's going to come a time where you cannot delegate this away to a vote. Mm -hmm. And he just looked at me like a cow looks at an oncoming train. He just... 
suddenly realized that there was some truth to that. And it wasn't just me bloviating or being hyperbolic. It was it was a dead set truth. Yeah, it, you it can't vote away a Nazi. Yeah, you cannot. Uh, it definitely is not a certified uh, le- leftist armchair moment. It's it is a it's a big deal, and I'm, I'm even my pretty conservative father is starting to see it like what oh yeah one that one that base is actually starting to see things it's getting clever but uh I, no i do i really want to thank you for coming on here uh yeah. it's been a amazing opportunity sorry i i just wanted to you know say that yeah like like chris said thank you so much for for this uh if you send us your feet in the mail, we'll kiss them and send them back to you. <laughs> no need. It's uh, like, uh, it's, there was this uh, really good Irish folk singer named uh, David Gowan, and he had a good part in his song that said, uh, that no gods and very few heroes. And so, you know, you know, y'all out there, there was a reason why we made Tonight We Riot to not have any distinct named hero, and it's because each one of us, the workers, are heroes. You know, we each one of us has the potential to reach out to another person and start a union or start a neighborhood group or even just reading books with each other. That kind of stuff. Doing the little work makes the big work happen. God damn it. You're going to make me cry. Yeah, it's like that. <laughs> uh, that was a, that's amazing. But uh, we'll let you get back to it, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. You have yourself a great day and feel free to Absolutely. feel free to come on anytime if you ever want to. Uh, we consider you foxy folk now. You're amazing. <laughs> awesome. Love to be it. All right. All right. Well, good to talking to y'all. Y'all have a good, good rest of the day. You we'll too. do, Ted. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Holy shit. <laughs> like, Can we get a round of applause? Oh, my God, dude. I stopped breathing for a while, like, when he was talking about, like, okay, Oh, there's shit. a lot to uncover there that I I didn't realize I would be this nervous <laughs> going in um, like it, it started out and we were doing it. And then like when he was talking about like the fucking like all the shit about the connection to Counter-Strike and oh, my God, <laughs> this is a this is a moment in my life for sure. I'm very. Uh, oh, th- oh, holy moly. I I'm like, <laughs> I forgot to breathe, dude. <laughs> We can do this. Chris. We can get through this. Dude, that was so fucking awesome. Um, like I said, like Ted is such a he's phenomenal because you go and look shit up about him and it's like it's um it's like going into the archives. You really have to like kind of mm-hmm. like get your way through there. And him telling a story right now was just like it was like so much information I never knew. Um it's like he was just like um, heavy hitter. <laughs> like that I, I mean, we were that last quote. I'm not joking. It almost made me tear up. Yeah, like, no, that that shit. Oh no, my God. Fucking commies really have their uh, we, we got we got our quotes. We're unfortunately we're Twitch streamers. So, yeah, we're going to have clips. <laughs> we'll have the um, smarter people like Ted will have their quotes. We'll have our clips.